What if instead of shaking your couch and finding 50 cents to $1.50, how about if I found you $6,728? That's right, free money on today's episode. It's Brian Preston, the money guy. Well, if you found that much just by shaking some cushions in the couch, I'd say that uh, that person needs to invite me over over for dinner. I see the often. headline was actually how to find easy money, not yeah. free money, because yeah, there is yeah. some behavioral things you that will do need a to little occur. Bit to There's going to be some stuff, but it is, look, unique times. Without a doubt, I watch the news media. It reminds you how unique t- right now is, sure. and a lot of people are struggling um, to pay the bills, mm-hmm. and they're probably thinking about their finances in a little different way. And sure. I know whenever I've reached these type of moments – the first thing I do is look at how I'm spending money, how I'm using money, and I see if there's ways that I can maybe trim some corners, you know, cut cut a little bit off, yep, prune it back. And this is the perfect show for somebody who's in that type of situation, as well as maybe this whole thing of going through a pandemic is the perfect reset button for you to re look at how you've handled money as a resource in the past as well. And what I love about this show is that uh, nothing we're going to share is in, in, innately hard. It's not difficult. You don't have to have some superpower to be able to do it. You just have to be willing to put in a little bit of extra time, take the step one step further than the rest, and you can set yourself up for some really meaningful changes to your financial life. And this is evergreen. I, you know, I, I, one of the things when we did our content meeting uh, you know, everybody's talking about, should we still stay on pandemic? And sure. I was like, I think we could do something that is both helpful for people while they're trying to find extra money, mm-hmm. but also something that just shows that empire building mindset and what's needed to be successful in the long term. Yep. This show checks all the boxes. Love it. And here's, you you put in a solid add in, Bo, because we talked about, because realistically, this could create around $600 a month of savings for somebody. Yep. If you just follow the checklist we're about to go through. But then when we're talking about short-term mindset, because that's what that $600 a month mm-hmm. does, but there's a long-term benefit as well. I always tell people, if you can put your money to work for your army of dollar bills, the changes we're going to talk about today in retirement could equate to about 40 thousand dollars a year and then you had a solid drop in with will smith anything that has an episode with will smith in it makes it better yeah so this it made me think of this quote that will smith has he tells this story uh and this is what will smith says when he tells the story he said you don't need you don't set out to build a wall you don't say i'm going to build the biggest baddest greatest wall that's ever been built you don't start there you say i'm going to lay this brick as perfectly as a brick can be laid and you do that every single day, and soon you have a wall. And I thought about that's what building financial independence is. And everything that we're going to talk about today is just one more brick that you can lay more perfectly than you've laid your previous bricks, and you're going to set yourself up for long-term wall-building success. Well, most people, because when you think about the grand journey of building financial independence, the objective seems too big to comprehend. Mm-hmm. But if you can look at this, just like Will talked about, because this is actually built on a story of him and his brother, every day after school for a year and a half, their dad had them rebuild a wall in the back of the house. And he said it just seemed ridiculous, but after accomplishing it, it was one of those life things that he learned that it really can change your perspective. Focus on the steps forward and then know where you want to be, and you really can turn those short-term movements into tremendous long-term goals. So let's talk about how to uh, lay some bricks on today's show. So the first brick we want to do, and like I said, these are all steps that we think everybody can look at their personal finances and figure out how you squeeze a little bit more. Because remember, we haven't mentioned this on a show in quite a while. I expect everybody that's part of the Money Guy family your money is different. A dollar bill in your hand is different than the dollar bill to probably your neighbors, your relatives, and your peers, because I'm counting on every dollar to go 5% to 25% more than your friends and peers. And I mean that. I mean, and this is one of those shows that's going to change your mindset and understanding the value and potential of every dollar. And the first is, let's talk about savings accounts. Yep. But we are shocked when people come see us. We have prospects that come to us as well as just money guy people that reach out. And one of the first things when I ask them about cash reserves, I, you know, I'm usually I'm like, wow, that's great that you saved that much. What's it doing for you? Yeah. Where is it invested? Are you maximizing even the money that you're keeping in cash? And when they tell me it's just in their brick and mortar bank, it kind of saddens me. It's a, a little, little bit. disheartening. I mean, we we've done the shows before about how many folks can't come up with even a thousand dollars for an emergency, and we know that. 
emergency reserves are something we need. So the first part is just kind of getting getting the emergency bucket filled up. But just like you said, I'm amazed when someone says, oh yeah, yeah, it's just sitting in my checking account. I've got six months of expenses and it's right there. I've done what I'm supposed to do. And we're just thinking, oh my goodness, but you could be doing so much more with that. And uh, I think a lot of people coming out of this pandemic, a lot of people are now understanding the value of having cash mm-hmm. reserves. So this will also be a great instructional point to do it right. Yep. And I always tell people, you know, we like high yield savings accounts, still FDIC insured because they, they get that additional protection in there. But it is one of those things where you can do cash right. Be careful of just going with your brick and mortar default option. They're yep. trying to get a little better. I know Wells Fargo had some aggressive things they were doing, but they were like most times they're usually teaser rates. Sure. I want you to get outside of teaser rates and think about how do I have a savings account that will last me long term and, and pivot and change with me. And, and here's something that I always share. You can keep your normal traditional brick and mortar bank. This is something you might be able to go online, open up an account, link the two accounts together so that you still get the flexibility and convenience of your brick and mortar, but you have the high yield savings account that's doing even better for you. Now, so we're having some comments coming in right now saying, hey, you know, some of the brick and mortars are actually paying pretty decent. We're, We're not saying that you can't use a brick and mortar. What we're saying is you really do need to pay attention to what interest rate you're earning on your savings. Whatever that bucket of money that sits there, that's not going to be spent, that's not part of your like monthly paying bills, you should have it sitting out there earning something. There are resources out there that you can use to go shop, okay, who is paying the best rates? Whether it is an online high yield savings account, or even if it's a brick brick and mortar where you happen to have your checking account at. And I am glad they're making positive strides forward, but here's the reality. They have been woefully mm-hmm. behind their online peers. I mean, the, the average brick and mortar, uh, average savings rate at a brick and mortar is like 0.09%. And that's, that's next to that's nothing. practically nothing. And, that, and let's kind of jump into, we know that the typical family, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, makes about 50,000, uh, the average person makes about, about $50,000. Yep. So if you take a couple, that's, you know, Two people together, that's about $100,000 a year. We think that after you get through some of the basics, it would be nice if you had twenty-five dollars to $30,000 saved up in cash reserves. Great. If you took that off of just the normal average savings rate of what's being paid, it's 0.09%, which works out to be about $27 a year. I mean, that I'm thinking, so I've got $30,000 sitting on the sidelines. And when I get my, my year end statement showing how much interest I made, and it says 27 bucks, I don't get super, they don't, I don't feel like my arm, my $30,000, my 30,000 soldiers, I don't feel like they worked very hard that year if that's all they're giving back to. You me. didn't maximize it. So that's what, if we flip the script and you look right now, now look, this is low. I mean, because mm-hmm. if we'd have just done this show a year ago, we had online savings accounts that were paying close to two and a half percent. That's right. But right now, you can expect to get somewhere around one and a quarter to one point three percent because interest rates have been on the downtrend sure. recently with everything that's going on. But still, even at one and a quarter percent, that same amount of money would generate about three hundred and seventy-five dollars a year. So let's pause there for a second. You did nothing different other than holding thirty thousand in one account. I'll give you twenty-seven bucks. Holding thirty thousand in a different account. We'll give you three hundred and seventy-five dollars. It almost seems crazy to walk away from that. I don't want to call it free money, but it kind of is free money because you'd have to do anything to go get it. You just had to open an account and move the money in there. So we're talking about around three hundred and fifty dollars a sure. year just off of this one behavioral change. But let me tell you how to do this right. This mm-hmm. is it. We want to give you some 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 data just to help you out. Is that? First of all, you can still get FDIC insurance. A lot of people are nervous if I start dealing with online banks. um, FDIC insurance might be scary. You can go to FDIC.gov, and they have a bank finder um, link. You can even go on Google and just do a search for bank finder FDIC, and it's going to verify that your online option is actually covered. And now, Bo, tell them, because you've gotten caught by the teaser rates. Yeah. Be careful with that. I was going to say, there are sort of two things you need to watch out for. The first one is the bait and switch. Uh, back, this is probably a little over a decade ago, You know, we'd started using high-yield savings accounts, and Brian had found one that was a great payer. But in true Bo fashion, I wanted to <laughs> one-up him and do a little bit better. So I went to bankrate.com at the time, and I found a bank that was paying a higher rate by like 
0.05% than Brian, yeah. and I was really going to stick it to him. So I went and opened that account, and I put my money in there, and I was stoked. And I rubbed it in your face for all of a week until about 30 days later, they dropped my rate. That rate that I had gotten was just a teaser rate, and they dropped it down, and it never inched back up. It never came back up. They were just trying to collect dollars, and then they dropped it down to a lower rate. So one of the things you have to make sure of is if you are going to go select a bank, whether it's an Ally or Capital One or an ING or fill in the blank, you want to make sure you pick one that is perennially in the top. They stay at the top of the rankings because you don't want to get in one that just adjusts after the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, because then you really haven't done yourself any well, favors. Yeah, they, they do the whole bait and switch. They use the high teaser rate to get the assets in, but then they quickly adjust it down because here's what you don't want to do. Setting up bank accounts, kind of annoying. Yep. So you want to do it once, measure twice, cut once, be done with it. That's why you'd already mentioned like Ally. Mm -hmm. But here's something I like for younger people with Ally. And look, we get nothing for saying this. It's just one of those things where I think it's a value add. They now do car loans. They do mortgages. So just like with a brick and mortar, you want a banking relationship that grows with you as your life expands sure. and your needs change. I got to tell you, some of these online banks have done a really good job of expanding their offerings too. So, and you've already mentioned, Brian, we are kind of this unique time where interest rates are so low. One of the things you do need to make sure you keep an eye on as you select which bank, you want to choose one that is also going to move with rates. So we think that potentially interest rates could come up. We don't know if it's going to be quick or slow or what the, the velocity of that will be, but you want to make sure you pick one that as rates rise, it also rises. Just because it's great right now doesn't mean it'll be great a year from now, so make sure you're keeping an eye on that. So if we're putting it up on the scoreboard, this one move could add $348 to your back pocket, your wallet, your purse per year. Love Pretty it. incredible. Brick number one, 350 bucks. Number two, Employer match. This one kind of shocked me because, guys, when we talk about financial order of operations, respecting the foo, a lot of people are shocked. Right after you do keep the deductibles covered to keep your financial life out of the ditch, we move right to match because, mm -hmm. yes, credit card interest debt of 17%, 20%. Is painful, but you know what offsets that when you can make fifty to one hundred percent guaranteed because your employer is giving you matching money. Imagine my shock when I start doing research for the show, and I find out that there's a good portion of the population, twenty percent according to research from Fidelity, twenty percent of the population is not maximizing their employer match. So when I hear you say that, Brian, I'm going to say it back to you in a different way. There's 20% of the population that just doesn't like free money. Yeah. We say this all the time at 401k presentation we go to. If we were to just set up a table outside and say, hey, when you leave your office today, just come by. This bag of money has your name written on it. Pick it up and take it with you. 20% of the population would just walk right past the table, not take their free Nobody money. Nobody would do that in person, but somehow, and these, by the way, that's a bag of money. You, If you did 20 bucks, if you put $20 bills with everybody's name, nobody would walk away from it. But yet somehow, because it's people's employer match, mm -hmm. they're leaving thousands of yep. dollars on the table. And, and uh, look, it's not even... 20% I, I, doesn't do it justice sure. because Fidelity found that in their research. Wells Fargo went a step further, looked at all their retirement plans and tried to break it out by age group. Here's what I thought was interesting. 25% of boomers aren't saving enough to get the full match. Okay. That's that's people getting people close to little, retirement. Yep, that's right. 31% of Gen Xers are folks. not getting, that's me, I'm in that Gen X, and then 37% of Millennials, now we're getting in close to 4 out of 10 people are not doing what they're supposed to on the Millennial side of things to get the full match. And why this breaks my heart, as we know, because of 88 times over and how compounding interest works, the match is the most valuable for these younger folks. Yeah. Yet, as the age rate decreases, as the value of those dollars de increases, People are doing it less. It just it doesn't make any sense. Well, it shows that it's the it's the adult marshmallow test, yep. and the fact that people don't understand you have to give a little bit of today to have that great big beautiful tomorrow yep. of the future. Have that long term mindset. So let's put some numbers. To this we already talked about in our previous um, point brick, as you called it, yep. is that the average person makes, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics, about $50,000 a sure. year. So a couple makes $100,000. If we could put that in context, typically, if you put in 6%, your employer's going to give you like 50 cents on the dollar. Sure. So that's 3%. 
this potentially is $3,000 a year Mm -hmm. that is working for the household, that army of dollar bills, so you don't have to work with your back, your brains, your hands. The money is doing the work for you. And I thought it was great. The research, according to Wells Fargo, because maybe people are getting some Some of of it. Maybe they're not just doing nothing. Maybe they're doing a portion. Wells Fargo actually put a number to it. They figured out per person in their plans, or if you looked at it on average, it's about $750 a person. So as a couple... That is fifteen hundred dollars a year, and th- again, this kind of blew my mind. People are doing some of the match, not get it. Again, it's like if we had that table set out and yeah. we had the twenty dollar bills. They made change. They made change. I said, "Hey, can I? <laughs> I don't want the twenty. Just give me the ten. You can't. No one would Instead do of that." Instead of the twenty dollar bill, they left a five dollar bill sitting there. Like so, I didn't feel like I was worthy of the twenty. Like a piece of homework right now. If you don't know what your employer matches, go figure that out. Make sure that you are getting that money because just like you said, Brian, if on average a person misses out on seven hundred and fifty dollars. For a couple, that's an extra fifteen hundred dollars a year that you could get from matching. Yeah, that 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 just blows my mind. That's incredible. So, brick number three: cutting the cord and watching your subscriptions. (laughs) Do you want to pick? Well, we won't pick on them. We can pick on them later. Yeah. By the way, cutting the cord. I I told Daniel when we do a pre-show meeting. We needed a coaxial cable in the picture, not a Cat5 cable. You don't cut the internet cord. That's the wrong one. <laughs> this was, he said this is what he had to work with, so we went with it. We love FTE, Daniel. But, and look, here's a stat that kind of shocked me a little bit. is They have done research, and as of 2019, traditional pay TV providers dropped 6 million customers last year. That's a 7% decline year over year. I got to tell you, with this whole stay-at-home order, uh-huh. I bet that number is accelerated. Think I think so? there are a lot of people right now who are questioning when they're trying to figure out where are there a few extra dollars I can put in my back pocket. One of the first things they're looking at is how are they doing their content? How are they doing TV? How are they doing local channels? This is one of the first places. I mean, whenever I've gotten in financial, like think about two, when I went through 2008, I cut the landscapers. I cut my cable bill. Yep. I, I looked at all my cell phone bills. These are the type of mindset things we want you to think about. And there's money here, guys. I cut the cord. Um, I went to YouTube TV sure. probably two years ago. Yep. And, I, and this is the perfect time to do it, guys. Because thinking about the timing, a lot of you guys don't want to leave because you might have a DVR full of shows. Guess what? We're hitting the summer months. There's no new shows out there. So you can go watch your D- your DVR, clear it out, and then quickly switch over to a new provider and save some bucks. Mm-hmm. So I know like a lot of folks, they hear this like, oh yeah, you know what? I'm going to cut the cord and this is going to be great. So I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of my cable and then I'm just going to, but I'm going to go get my YouTube TV. Then I'm going to get my Sling. Then I'm going to get my Netflix. Then I'm going to get my Disney Plus. And I'm going to get my Hulu. You do have to keep an eye on your all-in cost. You have to be aware that just because you're cutting one cost doesn't mean you need to immediately replace it with six other costs that end up being more expensive than what you originally had. I do think that, that there's a new trend. Subscription costs have um, gotten to the point where you can worry about stacking too many things. Sure. My wife, like, you know, Apple. Apple has some new shows. There's some Jennifer Aniston, Reese Witherspoon type the new, thing. The new, are they new? Or it's like uh, news reporters? We're not watching it because I told my wife, I have <laughs> limits to how many subscriptions we're going to have in sure. our household. And, um, and I think everybody needs to be mindful because, look, you're not getting rid of your internet. We picked on Daniel about that picture, and we know that the average household pays about $65 a month for high-speed internet. So that's a, a kind of a sunk cost. Mm-hmm. And you got to be careful when you're cutting cable, you might lose some of those bundle benefits. So you need to pay attention to that as you're making these decisions as well. But it's not uncommon that you see just your cable bill, not internet, Break $100 a month, especially when you think about it, because these old school business models, like I I think about, I have an upstairs TV, never use it, you know, but it had a separate box on it. They were charging me five bucks Uh a month for that separate box. They were charging me, now they probably have dropped this because it's been two years. They were charging me for HD fees or oh, high wow. definition service. You're like, what are you is, guys doing? Is I there mean, standard definition? We are in 2020. <laughs> Nobody is paying, but it was like that. And what I like about some of these newer formats like YouTube TV, they don't care how many TVs you have in your house. It's more of how many people can be on at one sure. time. And, and by the way, a lot of these options now have DVR opportunities yep. too. So if you're worried about you're going to not be able to be there or you're not going to have your local TVs channels, they're all there now. So you, I agree with Bo. Watch the stacking of mm-hmm. subscriptions. But if you were looking at this from 
the raw ability to replace cable TV, you could potentially drop your $100 cable bill down to, realistically, because YouTube TV is now about forty nine ninety nine dollars a okay. month, you could save it's somewhere between, I, I, we just used in our assumption, 40 bucks a month. Yep. And I think what we had found was that the average American, and uh, uh, this actually statistics, spends ninety about $90 a month on cable. Oh, I was using my numbers. Uh, See, oh, that's is that yours? Me. No, no. 90 is the average. Oh, I'm yeah, just yeah. saying when I'm throwing out 100, 100 I just yeah, know yours, I'm yeah. getting dinged. I was getting dinged by all the different boxes, the DVR fees. I just got tired of it. Sure. And try to cancel your cable service, by the way, <laughs> or your satellite service. They will send you to four different people to try to retain the business. And meanwhile... You can cancel YouTube TV right through the website. I loved how portable the whole process yeah, was. I, I'll be honest. I tried to. So when you first cut the cord, I don't know. It was like three, four years ago, maybe. I tried to call and cut the cord, and my cable company kept offering me such a good deal. I was like, well, okay, I guess I'll just keep it. Well, okay. The only reason I finally ended up cutting the cord is because I moved houses and to yeah. cancel my service, anyways. But what, what we found is average American spends ninety dollars per month on cable and about twenty three dollars a month on streaming services, okay. right? And odds are you're stream you're probably not going to get rid of streaming services. You're probably still going to use it. Like you're, just because you go to YouTube TV, you probably didn't ax Netflix, right? No, but but I'm I'm kind of but I'm thinking about if I was if I was a person who was in a, maybe this pandemic, I lost a job, sure, or money's tight. I probably will cut subscription services if I was, and I so if I was trying to figure out what are the savings, sure. I do think there's probably forty to forty five dollars a month you could save by cutting the cord Love and it. still having your access to your your sporting events mm-hmm. whenever they come back, as well as local TV. So I mean that's if you were looking on the brick scoreboard as we're kind of calling it using the Will Smith quote, is that you could save close to five hundred dollars a year just by getting creative with how you're watching content on the internet. So for those of you that are kind of keeping score, I don't know if you know, these bricks are starting to kind of turn into something a little bit. Stay tuned because it gets even more exciting. So let's move on to number four. This is one I've done shows, one of our more popular shows back before YouTube. This is Mm -hmm. pre-YouTube, back when it was just a podcast. We did a show that got some media attention called How to Save $200 a Month with Just a Few Phone Calls. Yep. It's gotten easier, guys. We call this the ungrateful service providers. There are several of your service providers out there that their business models are set up that the longer your customer, you would think there'd be some loyalty to that. Nope. Their business models actually penalize you for being a loyal customer because they have automatic rate increases Mm -hmm. and they give better rates to new customers than loyal customers. So frustrating. So you have to be careful. And look, I get all kind of negative emails. Last time we did a show called, because I titled it Ungrateful Service Providers. A lot of my service people were like, we love our clients. Change that title. I'm like, look, you might be the greatest agent in the world, but you have to admit that your business model is set for the industry is for those that are not staying on top of what you're paying on a monthly basis you do pay more for being a loyal customer. So yep. what do you have to do? It doesn't mean you have to fire your insurance company. Now let's kind of get into some of these. Is You can go and shop your homeowners, your sure. auto insurance. All these type of services are something you should go look at every three years at least. So that's you said right there, auto and homeowners. That's a great, you know, one of the very first things that we do, uh, whenever someone becomes a new client, one of the things we generally ask them is, hey, Let's talk a little bit when we get into the financial planning portion. Let's talk a little bit about your insurance policies, your auto policy, your umbrella policy, your homeowners. And one of the very first things we do is we review what are the deductibles yeah. on your plan. Because one of the easiest ways to decrease the premium for what you pay for your insurance is to increase your deductible. Well, and you and I have even had some personal. Mm-hmm. We have we have client stories as well as our own personal discussions. Because sure. I had this, and this is because you just recently moved, Bo. Yep. And we had a whole discussion about your deductible, and I shared, and, and you kind of corrected me on this. I, I hate telling you you were right, <laughs> but it, but it is one of those things. I shared that I, I have a thousand dollar deductible in my house. Sure. When I looked at pushing it up to twenty five hundred dollars or something, it, the the price difference wasn't much. It mm-hmm. was like I think twenty dollars a month. Sure. It was very negligible. And you corrected me. You said, "Look, are you going to use?" that insurance on less than a $2,000 repair. And I was like, no way. So you're like, every dollar, even no matter how small it is, is a true savings because you will never use that insurance 
for a lesser known issue. Because realize, and this is something you guys need to know, because I know you have a story to oh, share. Yeah. Your insurance on your cars, on your house, even though it might have a $500 deductible, if you have a $700 repair, you better not use it. Mm -hmm. Because, guys, it is supposed to be catastrophic coverage, not for nicks and dings. Because we have a woefully scary story mm -hmm. on if you're using your insurance to actually correct nicks and dings, what that means for you in the long term. Yeah, so I have some dear, dear clients who I love, and they have uh, three children, two of which have recently become driving age. Well, within the first six months which of them- Which is scary just within itself. It, it, absolutely. With, within the first six months of them driving, uh, there was an accident where one child was backing out of the driveway and backed into the other child's car, right? You know, just kind of getting used to that. Well, then there was a moving infraction where there was an accident. Well, our client was just like, yeah, you know, there's some damage. I want to get these things fixed for that. So they filed claims. Well, what they didn't realize is every time that they filed a claim, their premiums were going up. Well, because they had three uh, filed three claims within a six to nine month window, when it came up time for renewal, the insurance company said, no way, no how, we're not going to give you insurance. So they actually had to go find new insurance with a, I'm going to call it a, a substandard or, or high risk provider. And it doubled the cost of their insurance. They would have been way better off just fixing the cars out of pocket, not filing claims instead of filing that many claims in quick succession. So remember, catastrophic coverage, not actually for Every little thing that happens. That's why I always tell, I mean, my wife hit the garage back at our old house in Georgia. I paid to repair it myself sure. because yep. there's no way I'm filing that claim. I waited until we had water damage in the house. We had a pipe burst in a, in a fluke freeze storm in Georgia years ago. That's when I filed an insurance claim because it was a big one. Sure. And, you know, but every little nick and, and thing that happened, even if it was a thousand dollar repair, scared to death to use it. I know a lot of people, you're thinking, well, I'm paying these premiums. Well, I need to get some benefit out of it. No, you're paying these premiums for catastrophic mm -hmm. protection. This protection is so you don't put your financial life in the ditch. Let's put some numbers to this, boat to show people what we're talking about from a savings perspective, though. Uh, so I think what we found is, so obviously one of the things you can do is you can adjust your current policy. You can move the deductibles to adjust the premium. But another thing that you can do is you can shop around at different insurance providers and different companies. And we found that for a 35-year-old, the average six-month premium for car insurance is $760 or about $1,500 per year. That's the average, $1,500 per year. But we know that the way that you behave, if you are a safe driver and you don't drive an expensive car, your insurance rates can be much, much lower than that if you have a solid driving record. Yeah, and it, and it pays to shop this because we, we, I did a little research. NerdWallet found that the average driver could save approximately $859 a year or $72 a month yep. just by shopping. Like I said, every three years, you need to be shopping your rates. Even if you're not changing your insurance carrier, you still shop it to make sure it's the right rates. And then if you couple that with raising the deductible, mm -hmm. We think that there's probably a thousand dollars a year, but listen to this. A lot of you guys, seventy percent of consumers have had the same auto insurance company for four or more years. And I don't think it's because they think they're the best auto insurance company in the world. No. I think it's because they probably just haven't shopped it. And then thirty-eight percent of car insurance customers have never compared auto insurance quotes. So guys, go out there and find that thousand dollars a year. That's a big savings. No. There are some amazing captive agencies out there. You know, they have all the commercials on TV and they're fantastic. One of the things that we like to do, I know I do this personally and you do as well, Brian, when it comes to property and casualty insurance, we like using independent agents. Because what happens is every year when I get my email, Mr. Hansen, your auto and homeowners and umbrellas up for renewal, I say, great, will you send me quotes for the top three or four companies you represent? Because independent agents can represent 20, 30, 40 different companies. And if they're the ones doing all the paperwork, helping get it in place, it takes the process, the difficulty, the process of changing down a ton. If you work with an agent that only works for insurance company ABC, they're only going to recommend policies with insurance company ABC. So just be aware of that. Yeah. At a minimum, go shop it, guys. Just because I know a lot of you, I, you have... 
guaranteed coverage so that you never can get dropped sure. like we talked about, you know, so you don't want to lose your your legacy standing there, but just at least promise yourself that you're going to shop this to, to, to find that $1,000 a year. Love it. So again, stacking bricks, shopping providers and grouping insurance, we think that that conservatively could save 1000 bucks a year. So moving on to the next brick, number five, this is one of those things where I think people typically, when you get tight on money, you start looking around and wondering if some of these bad decisions you've made in the past can I turn this regret into a positive? Yep. And I got to tell you, a lot of times you can sell junk that is sitting around your house. I mean, it is, I know it's crazy. I mean, I'm always surprised and we'll get into the details, but electronics, um, if you, if you made some bad decisions on designer clothes or designer accessories like belts or handbags, if you have some watches, um, vehicles, I mean, there's, there's all kind of things. There's a market out there. Technology has made it where you can get in front of people a lot easier in the past because there is an analysis. I always have to figure out, is it better to donate it or should I try to see if I can go out there and sell, sell this yeah. stuff? And, and I'm fortunate to tell you, there's a lot of things out there that have made this process so much easier. Sure. And now I will tell you, one of the problems, and we're going to talk about some of the tools you can use, is when it does come to selling your stuff, I think that you need to have a realistic expectation because I know with my wife all the time, I say, Babe, we gotta go through, let's just go through your closet. You have clothes you don't, like, you don't wear this anymore. You don't, you know, yada, yada, yada. I'm like, let's at least donate it because that's something we can do. And she'll be like, no, well, I, no, I can't. I know how much I paid for that. You know, you, we anchor right. ourselves to some of the stuff that we've bought that we don't even use anymore. When it does come time to sell your stuff, you need to have a realistic conversation with yourself about what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. Cause we struggle with it. We, when I, when I start doing this, Brian, it's not because of things have gotten tied or things are getting scary. It's because, I'm just getting tired of the clutter. I've just yeah. got too much stuff. I want to get rid of it. Make sure you have realistic expectations going into it of what's your stuff. You called it junk. I'm going to call it stuff is actually worth. Yeah. And let's get, let's give some of these resources. The first one, like designer clothes, Poshmark, you can designer clothes, shoes, jewelry, handbags. Great. Here's one, by the way, I was out in Vegas pre COVID mm -hmm. and um, I was, we were meeting another couple um, the former neighbors, they moved back to Chicago, and he took me to every watch shop. He's a watch guy. Okay. I mean, I'm walking around with the Apple, Apple Watch, yep. you know, so they're not getting too excited about that. But what was interesting is he has a whole collection, and he was asking the guys, how do I, how do I get rid of, you know, I, I think I want to upgrade, but how do I get rid of all the watch shops? We're mentioning this website, stockx.com. Huh. You can go and price um, watches. But here's another thing, one of the watch salesmen. Show, and I thought this was because we just watched Last Dance. He sells Nikes, Air Jordans, and other okay. things. You can do sneakers, watches, streetwear, collectibles, handbags. Huh. It's pretty incredible if you go on there and just play around with that website. If anything, it will show you what the market value is out there on Great. past sales. So you can use this for yourself. Electronics, gazelle.com. And look, I've used this for myself in the fact that you know, when I have old iPhones or an iPad or something like that, I'll go see what Gazelle is offering, and I use that as a determination if I should then sell it myself with a service like eBay, mm -hmm. you know, because I have sold electronics. What was funny is I saw the quotes on here of what people could actually get for stuff, and uh, what was funny to me was I saw MacBooks were somewhere between four to $800. Okay. They didn't even know I had put this in the show notes. This MacBooks were four to eight hundred dollars. I believe it was Reby said, "Yeah, I got I got like six hundred dollars or seven hundred dollars for an old MacBook I had." And then Daniel was like, "Yeah, I had a twenty thirteen model that I got like four or five hundred dollars for." So these numbers actually, actually hold legit. up. And this is free money. And Daniel was like, "Yeah, I couldn't believe it, it was a twenty thirteen computer still got me four or five hundred dollars." Awesome. That shows how some of these things will actually hold up their value. So you ought to go look at it. And by the way, if you do, here's a, here's something I have been burned on this and I just want to make a PSA about it. If you do use eBay, eBay, I don't know if they still do this, but they a lot of times they will default to a global sales. Um, you need to stay in the US only. There's a lot of shenanigans, a lot of, you know, danger zones if you're trying to sell, you lose some of your protections. If you go outside the United States, they'll try to make you feel better about it on eBay. But I'm just telling you, if you want to save yourself a lot of heartache, I usually stay within U.S. only on those sales. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here. This is something we didn't talk about show prep, but I just generally have a curious question. Okay. And this is not something we covered. So nobody in studio knows where I'm going right now, which uh -huh. is awesome. 
I noticed that all the stuff that we talked about talked about are like sort of electronic <laughs> listings, electronic. We didn't mention like yard sales or doing garage sales or that kind of thing. Is there a reason that we're kind of sticking to, you know what, price it online, list it online. Is it likely that you're going to get better value if you do it that way than if you just have a garage sale and put it all out in the driveway? I mean, I think when garage sales are designed to just get stuff out of your house. Sure. We wanted to do this show on how you can maximize what your stuff is worth. I definitely think that these techniques are more of a maximization technique. Got it. And so if you're needing money, this is a way to go squeeze every dollar of value out of it. If you're just trying to get it out of the house, garage sales, donations. Got it. That stuff, because look, donations, by the way, are super powerful as well. Because if you're, especially if you're in a high tax bracket, mm-hmm. I mean, where if you think, if you're paying in the 37% federal bracket and then your your state tax bracket is 6% or so, Everything you donate, you're still there's a, a value of forty percent sure. value is coming off the taxes for the the thrift value that you're donating. So that's that's powerful stuff. And we can, by the way, because you mentioned how you would get rid of like lawn equipment, you can get big value from lawn equipment even at yard sales. So yep. I think that's something. But when you're talking about electronics, no, if, I don't care how good your yard sale is. If you set up an iPad, I mean a, a, a MacBook table, you're probably your not going to unload them. You're not going to get great value. You can get gr- that for a weed eater because sure. people will come around yard sales and give you great value on a weed eater, but you're not going to be able to get MacBook Pros sold at a yard sale very well unless you probably live in Silicon Valley or something. And then furniture. I mean, you can go put a couch out in your driveway, mm-hmm. but you're probably going to sell it for 10 bucks. Whereas if you put it on you know, Craigslist or, or Facebook Marketplace... I mean, I sold a dresser. I mean, that for three hundred and fifty bucks. You know that I paid six hundred dollars for it, brand new. And you used so it I for still, I, we used it and then sold it for three fifty. I was like, this is great. outstanding. So I mean, it is. And that, that, look, this is one. I'm going to go against something that you're probably going to be surprised. My wife has shown me that sometimes this is where brand names actually do benefit you. She okay. showed me on some of children's clothing's where she could. Buy this brand that costs a little bit more, but the market value on resales for some of this stuff was over fifty percent. You it retained Actually over fifty value. Same thing with furniture. Like if you bought a Pottery Barn dresser, you're like, gosh, that, that, seems, that thing seems overpriced because I could go on Wayfair and buy something that looks very similar. The resale market on like Pottery Barn is much higher. So there is some some you're give ma- and take. You have you're to making pay me attention. feel somewhat because I, I, I you're making me feel better about some horrible decisions that I've made. In the well, past. no, I've, I've done other now custom <laughs> stuff. Like we have a custom couch we bought when we, we first got married. You know, and it's one of those things when you start having some success, you're like, well, I I'm should sure get a custom successful couch. people buy nice furniture. No. Nice furniture gets torn up by kids is what happens. And, and then you, if you pay too much for furniture, you don't want to get rid of it, and you get stuck with this. Yeah. And by the way, nobody wants hand-me-downs on the <laughs> furniture. You think that you're buying an heirloom that's going to get passed down. You, your kids don't want that stuff. So just be aware that this is a use asset that you'll probably donate, get rid of. So so pay attention when you're buying. But Love it. putting numbers on this, what can you make? Um, we think you can easily, easily... Come up with a thousand dollars from just cleaning out the house, and if you need perspective on that, cell phones, one hundred and twenty-five dollars for a broken iPhone, three sixty for one that's in a good condition, MacBooks, four hundred to eight hundred dollars. You heard from Daniel; his was seven years old, and he still mm-hmm. got a tremendous amount. Gift cards, I guarantee, is a drawer in your house with a bunch of gift cards that you're just like. I haven't eaten at Red Lobster in 16 <laughs> years, you know. And it, but you could. By the way, I like cheddar biscuits, so it's not me. I have <laughs> eaten like, at a Red Lobster. Uh, but Red just, Lobster executives, you're listening. I, I'm the thinking about my wife, <laughs> my, the difference in our our thoughts on food. But I guarantee you have a gift card, and usually you can get back somewhere around 92 percent of a gift card's value at some of these online sites that let you sell that stuff. So go out there and find that thousand dollars. So if we're looking at the scoreboard again, selling your stuff, that's another thousand dollars a year all right so i'm seeing brick after brick after brick after brick it's just starting to turn into some real money well we got one more to cover and this is a big one this is something bo you sent out an email over the weekend to the to the content team Mm -hmm. and you said we ought to use this in a future show and it was all these logos of all these companies we use but none of them were in existence in 2007 this this podcast predates all of those 
industries co- like, and it's unbelievable. It to was me. like Uber. I mean, it was it was it was so many brands that we have now come to use uh-huh. on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and and these things didn't even exist ten years ago. So there's a great opportunity for a lot of us, especially. Look, a lot of jobs just aren't the same anymore. That's right. you, you know. Hopefully, a lot of you are getting to work from home or you're, you've got flexibility. But if you're not, I don't want you to despair. There's still ways to make money. Sure. And that's this whole gig economy or side hustling. Yep. There's something there. And I couldn't, I was shocked by this number that Daniel shared with me. Now, I will tell you on our building a brick detail, we didn't use this number because I was like, man, I don't want to scare people no. by throwing out such a big number. But Daniel found that the average side hustle brings in. Eleven hundred and twenty-two dollars a month. That blew. Did that, did that blow your mind? That seems like a lot of money for a side gig, and that's the average. Now, okay, before you guys start throwing out, oh, you guys are using averages. We went a step further. Yeah. So the median from a side hustle is around two hundred dollars a month. There we go. And I, and I was like, you know, realistically, if you were just trying to figure out how you could maybe increase your monthly savings. You've heard me talk about the value of your do- army of dollar bills. You're in your 20s. You have a little extra time. You could go probably work four or five hours a week sure. and add an extra 200 to $300 a month to your savings. This is the long-term mindset that's going to change your life. So yep. we, we threw out some examples. Uber and Lyft. Oh, that's a gr- uh, it's that's that may be one of the biggest side gig things that is available. I think to almost everyone, so long as you have an automobile, and I think even if you don't have an automobile, they'll help you get an automobile to do that or something and, and, like and that. The, the research, because you hear it when you ask an Uber driver, "What do you make an hour?" and they'll tell you all over the place, but typically it's somewhere around fifteen dollars an hour. Sure. We found from our research, after you take into account expenses, it's somewhere around eight fifty-five to eleven seventy-seven per hour. So around ten dollars. But if you think about, you know, sitting around doing nothing, or you know, after you factor in all the expenses, going to make ten dollars per hour doesn't sound crazy just for kind of driving around. So there's probably a group of people right now because we are post or during the pandemic, they're like, sure. somebody riding, strangers riding around in my car <laughs> seems less it. than ideal. There's still, <laughs> there's still other side hustles you can do, like, think about this, Uber Eats, Instacart, mm-hmm. these things where you're going to picking up food for people or picking up groceries sure. for people. They also average about $10 an hour That's from great. going out there and doing the work. All these things create opportunity. They also, here's the thing, maybe you are already maxing out your Roth IRA. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're already maxing out your employer plan at work to get the match. Sure. And you're saying, well, are there other opportunities? Yeah. When you do these side hustles, you also qualify for like SEP IRAs. You yep. can do you can do qual you know some some beneficial retirement savings. There is all kind of benefit on here. We even put together some resources. Now look, this is where I felt old because I like when we went to when we talk about the other thing, I'd heard of Gazelle.com. Uh huh. I'd of course used eBay, but this section was alien territory. <laughs> so I'm going to rely on this was a Reby and Daniel collaboration. So let me give out a few of these. Upwork. Okay, great. Freelancing is what they put next to it. We'll go with that. Fiverr. The wild west of hiring people. So I think the way that this works is like, oh, I need my gutters cleaned. Or, oh, I have a project at the house that I can't do myself or I need a specialist. You can go into Fiverr and you can pay somebody to come, like a handyman, to come do that. Am I saying that right, Rich? Is that kind of like tackle? Oh, tackle's another one. That's a, That didn't even make the list. Look at you, old dog. I got Kathy Lee. <laughs> you know, she, she's practically a neighbor. I saw her for the first time um, a few weeks Dude, back. She though. power walks Franklin all the time. I like I like me some Kathy Lee. So my <laughs> wife even likes her more. But um, we so we like having her around town. Um, Rover Pet Care. Yep. If you want to go walk, walk dogs or pet sit, there's an app for that. And this one just cracks me up saying it out loud. Task Rabbit. That it's, that and, one I didn't know. Yeah, we have no idea what that is. And then here's something Daniel threw out because and I and I'm paying this right now my, myself. Teaching and tutoring. There's a great opportunity right now for side hustling as a tutor. Um, I have my daughter. She's preparing for the ACT, so we've got her doing virtual ACT prep right awesome. now online. Um, Daniel threw out this website, VIP Kids, if you want to go okay. be a teacher and, and do some tutoring. So there's all kind of opportunities on that. And then he also threw out the idea of content creation. Yeah, this is one that's kind of near and dear to our heart because accidentally content creation is what this thing was born out of. Well, now it's become so prevalent. Technology's changed the world so much that, yeah, you can go out there and you can write blog articles. You can ghostwrite. You can do videos. You can freelance videos. There's all kinds of ways out there that in your spare time, 
you can add to the internet of knowledge and be a resource for folks out there. So I watched this weekend, I watched that Tom Brady, Phil the Mickelson, golf yeah. Tiger Woods, and um, of course Peyton Manning, who seems like he should be my best friend now after finding out how <laughs> funny he is. But it was interesting is that while I'm sitting there, I had a neighbor, we had a few neighbors over watching it with us. And um, one of them says, hey, did you hear that they that Tom Brady had this charity online experience auction that a 25-year-old paid over $800,000 to do a Tom Brady experience. And he's like, do you know what that guy does for a living? He's a YouTube personality. And I was like, so he sent me an article. Sure enough, it's a, so your, your side gig, your online side gig, could turn into your main could gig. Could turn into your main gig if you have the right things going for you to where you too could be hanging out with Tom Brady and paying $800,000 to hang out with him with the right amount of money coming in. But even if you're not the Tom Brady experience kind of guy and you think about the bricks that you're laying, even if we went with the low conservative number, we think that a side gig realistically could produce for you probably $2,400 a year or $200 a month with a side hustle. So we have laid out, I mean, we should. I should have probably put a number on these. We got one, two, three, four, five, six Different. I look at Reby laughing, and she's she like, just, "This is the first time you counted just them." Our fingers. So, <laughs> so you can see we have six ideas here on how you can make extra money. But I want to go a step further. Sure. With I think that there is a big picture, teachable moment from this. We've already talked about it. How do you have an empire mindset so you make little fundamental changes in your financial life that have tremendous long-term benefits? We opened the show today talking about a Will Smith quote where he talked about this brick wall that he built with his brother one brick at a time for a year and a half. He'd come home from school, start putting a brick on the wall, and he said he wasn't thinking about the wall because the thought of building the wall was overwhelming, but he laid one brick. He made sure he laid each brick the best way it possibly could be laid, and then before he knew it, a year and a half later, it turned into a full, big, beautiful wall. And that's how financial independence is built. And we wanted to kind of, this is the mindset you have to have. But if you bring all of these different things together, Bo, what is this total? So the total is an annual savings of $6,728. And what I think is so remarkable about that is we just said that the average, you know, individual, you know, in the country makes around 50000 or if you double that for couples, mm-hmm. it's $100,000. This is a substantial sum of money. This yeah. is a lot of money. This is 5 to 10% of your annual income. Really, really exciting when you think about how valuable this could be on just a one-year basis. Yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is the fundamental brick. But what does the wall look like? If you've laid your brick... But you do this brick year over year. You add those bricks together. What does the wall look like, Bo? So you can save $6,728 extra every year from now until retirement. Because every one of these things is savings annually. It's not just a one-time thing. You can actually save this money every single year. Well, after 30 years, you will have saved $201,840, which in and of itself, pretty amazing. $200,000 just by taking one little extra step. But if you are that true financial mutant and you say, you know what, I'm going to go put that money to work. And you're a 35-year-old and we think that you can make on average about 8.5% per year, per year investing those dollars. That $201,000 will grow into $835,000. That number is, I mean, here's the thing. It needs to have some perspective because when I see that, I'm like, that is incredible. So just from a few small behavioral changes in my life, I could have the equivalent of $40,000 a year perpetually in retirement. I could essentially create my own pension. Here's another observation. This came from Raw Dog out there in Money Guy Family Land. He said when, when we were doing the live stream, he said, guys, that number, 6728 is so close to the annual Roth contribution. Mm-hmm. Think about if that $835,000 is tax-free. It'd be huge. I mean, th- this is the mindset. I want you to know little bricks can build tremendous financial walls for right. you in the long term, and it's so powerful. And this is the thing. I get. I remember when I first started saving, when I was in my 20s, it, it took forever, it feels like, to break $100,000. Yep. I remember it felt like 
man, am I ever going to, you know, because we want to be wealthy. We sure. want to reach seven-figure status. But just getting to $100,000 seems like the mark is moving against you, especially when you go through a downturn. Of course. Because, yeah. you, you know, I can still remember because I've been doing some show prep on some other things we're working on. Four years into working, all my reti- all my savings had it equaled up to about forty thousand dollars of market value. Mm-hmm. I then remember taking the dot com collapse. It my forty turned into twenty eight thousand, mm-hmm. and I remember going, "Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm never, never going get to have there. money." And I missed out on that great bull market of the nineties. This thing seems like it's moving against me. Now I look back and I go, "Wow." A little turns into a lot if you will just stay. Keep on course. Keep the behavior going. Put your foot before the next foot, the other foot. Keep walking forward. Keep laying bricks. This thing is powerful in the long term. Yeah, I, I think that's what was so amazing to me about this. And we almost got to a million bucks. I mean, it was like 800 something thousand. We almost got to a million without doing anything remarkable, without doing anything life-changing, without becoming some celebrity, without signing some huge contract, just taking very small steps to get to financial independence. And one of the things that we're going to commit to doing for you guys is we're going to help you continue to take those steps. If you haven't had a chance to go out to our website yet, you can go to moneyguide.com, click on the resource page. We have resources out there available for you. We've got PDFs and spreadsheets and worksheets, and it's all free. All you have to do is go out there, download it. You can use it, tape it to your mirror, and begin laying your bricks day by day to build a financial independence. Yeah, and we, by the way, we could have easily pushed this over a million dollars. We started at 35. We could have done 25. Sure. We could have done 30. We want to be realistic, though, because we know our average YouTube audience is somewhere, our, our biggest, we get to see who's watching us. 25 to 45 year olds. So we chose right in the middle at 35. We also can see, by the way, that the majority of you aren't part of the Money Guy family. You're watching our content, but you're not subscribing to it. (laughs) You haven't rung the bell to get notifications. Guys, go out there, join the family, subscribe to the actual channel. We are at 60, close to 63,000. I have the ambitious goal of being at 100,000 by year end. Not going to happen. This pandemic is going to ruin my goal unless you go tell your friends and families, subscribe to The Money Guy Show. That's how we're going to keep making a difference. Thank you for all the emails, the well wishes. We're going to keep stacking bricks for you guys so you can keep building your financial empires and make those walls as big, beautiful, and prosperous as possible. I'm your host, Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy Team, out.